Uh, I completed seven tours in Northern Ireland, all with the infantry or associated units. I lost many men, and I was involved in fatality shootings. I was investigated, along with others. The investigations were thorough, aggressive, and bloody awful to go through. When the investigations were completed, we sometimes had to go to court to prove that we'd acted in accordance with the yellow card. I told two soldiers in 1978 who were with me that because they'd been to court and been proved innocent and acted within the law, they would never ever be asked to do such a thing again. How the hell can our government allow such people yeah. to be possibly investigated yeah, again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to get to a point where, unless there is some brand new and credible piece of evidence which changes the situation, um, but in most cases that is not true, that is not the case. But they asked um, them to come and give but, evidence. Uh, exactly. So unless there is something which is uh, brand new, um, which was not available at the time, and in, in the vast majority of cases that is not the case, then at that point people should be entitled to consider that, that they do not have to face, do, do not have to face further pursuance through the court. And when I came back from Northern Ireland, and like many colleagues I served in Northern Ireland, when I came back I was given a General Service Medal. I was on operations. To us it was no different in peacekeeping there than peacekeeping anywhere else in the world. That's what British Army soldiers do. So to, to stand here and say there is a legal difference between a soldier going on ops in Iraq or Cyprus or anywhere else in the world and going to Northern Ireland is fundamentally wrong and that advice I challenged and challenged and challenged. How on earth have we got into this position where we won't defend our own soldiers because of some technicality that we weren't on ops? We are on ops and we were defending the public and our guys were killed and I will not have terrorists put in the same breath yeah, as British yeah, soldiers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, I deployed to Afghanistan twice and to Iraq and to Northern Ireland all in quite quick succession. I can tell the Minister that I received operational training, operational kit, I carried operational rules of engagement, I received operational pay and I received an operational medal for all four of those tours. So this distinction that as a soldier yeah, you are yeah. aware of the legal premise on which you are deployed is not true, it is not fair, yeah, and it yeah, stinks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Troops do not get to choose whether they deploy on an operational tour right. because of the legal underpinning that the government has chosen, and it is unreasonable to assert that now. Right, right. We must limit their liability immediately. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The Northern Ireland Office, under the Stormont House Agreement with parties in Northern Ireland, agreed to establish so-called legacy institutions to look into the past. The NIO's interpretation of this is that they will set up some form of commission that will go back to 1968-9, so 50 years, Mr Speaker, and re-examine every fatality again. That's something like 3,500 cases. So any serviceman, any member of the IUCGC who fired a fatal shot will be re-investigated, but the alleged terrorists will not. Because under the Good Friday Agreement, Tony Blair gave them so-called letters of comfort, which means they are immune from prosecution. No alleged terrorist who's ever been given one of these letters has been successfully prosecuted. The nearest we came was the alleged Hyde Park bomber. And when he produced his letter of comfort in court, the judge abandoned the trial and declared an abusive process. So this entire process would be utterly one-sided because service personnel and members of the RUCGC would be liable to prosecution. Those with letters of comfort are scot-free. Now, Mr Speaker, after the appalling, tragic events in Londonderry, we all want to see the Northern Ireland Executive re-established. Of course we do. But that cannot be at the price of some rancid backstairs deal between the Northern Ireland Office and Sinn Féin IRA to sell Corporal Johnny Atkins down the river as the price of re-establishing the executive. Up with that, sir, I believe this House will not put. Yeah. We have a moral duty to defend those who defended us 
and we abrogate that duty if, for reasons of political convenience, we allow the scapegoating of our veterans to pander to terrorists. In recognition both of the Right Honourable Gentleman's military background and of his former leadership of his party, I think the House should indulge him. Mr Ian Duncan Smith. Mr Speaker, I'm grateful to you and I apologise again. I came in uh, as, he was, as the Minister was on his feet. Can I just say to the Minister, I did serve in Northern Ireland. I also served in what was then Rhodesia. I got a General Service Medal for one and a separate campaign medal for the other. They were both operations, as our Honourable Friend has said, and we were sent to Northern Ireland and I lost friends, and particularly Robert Nyrak, who I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here uh, for that. And I don't know how I can honestly, with a clean heart, say that my government represents the best interests of ex-servicemen and women who have served their country. I simply say to him this simple uh, principle. When natural justice collides with the law, we change the law. Yeah.